A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marred was his look beyond human semblance and his appearance beyond that of the sons of man. So shall he startle many nations. Because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been told shall see, those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity, one of those for, from whom people hide their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured. While we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes were we healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth, like a lamb led to the slaughter or a sheep before the shearers, he was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away, and who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sin of his people, a grave was assigned among the wicked and a burial place with evildoers, though he had done no wrong nor spoken any falsehood. But the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light in fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt shall he bear. Therefore, I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked and he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for their offenses. The word of the Lord. I am an 
subject of reproach, a laughing stock to my neighbors and a dread to my friends. They who see me abroad flee from me. I am forgotten like the unremembered dead. I am like a dish that is broken. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. But my trust is in you, O Lord. I say you are my God. In your hands is my destiny. Rescue me from the clutches of my enemies and my persecutors. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your kindness. Take courage and be stout-hearted, all you who hope in the Lord. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord.
the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Whom are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he asked again, Whom are you looking for? Jesus the Nazarene. I told you that I am. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? The band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guards seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood by the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid who was the gatekeeper said to Peter, you're not one of this man's disciples, are you? I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made because it was cold and were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there keeping warm. priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in a synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather, and in secret I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there keeping warm, and they said to him, you are not one of them. I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Again, Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. <clears throat> Then they brought 
Jesus from Caiaphas to the, pres to the Praetorium. It was morning. And they themselves did not enter the Praetorium in order not to be defiled so they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. At this, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. Then the Jews answered him, We do not have the right to execute anyone. In order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, what he said indicating the kind of death he would die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Do you say this on your own? Or have others told you about me? I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest handed you over to me. What have you done? My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews, but as it is, my kingdom is not here. Then you are a king. You say I am a king. For this I was born. And for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. What is truth? When he had said this, he went again out to the Jews and said, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Not this one, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged, and the soldiers wove a crown of, out of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, king of the Jews. And they struck him repeatedly. One more, once more Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus went out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak, and he said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard that statement, he became even more afraid. And when he went back into the praetorium, he said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him. So Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know I have the power to release you and I have the power to crucify you? You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out. If you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement in Hebrew. Gabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. Behold your king, they cried out. Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then 
he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross himself, he went to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put up on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. soldiers had crucified Jesus. They took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it will be in order that the passage of scripture might be fulfilled that says, They divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus was his mother, and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine, so they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it up into his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the spirit. Since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first, and then of the other, who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified 
and his testimony is true, he knows that he is speaking through the truth so that you also may come to believe. For this happened so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again, another passage says, They will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus, and Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it in burial cloths, along with spices, according to the Jewish burial custom. Now in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb, in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day, for the tomb was close by. The Gospel of the Lord. And Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby. He said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to his disciple, behold your mother. It was to Mary and John whom the Christ engaged with his final words. No doubt after hearing them, John squeezed Mary a bit tighter. Jesus wanted John to be the son that his mother needed, the human son he could no longer be. Jesus gazed at Mary, his ache was from a pain far greater than nails and thorns. And in their silent contemplation, they shared a final embrace and a last farewell. Jesus turned in his dying hour to Mary his last thoughts were of his mother, sweet memories of her comfort and her care when he was a child. She who had been the guardian of his youth, perhaps the only member of his family to remain with him the foot of the cross. How much was she consoled in a moment of inconsolable grief as her only son makes every provision for her future. 
I imagine only a mother could experience a heart-wrenching sorrow of seeing her child taste the bitterness of death before her very eyes. A human mother in each and every way like any mother, save without sin. And although she was the mother of God, the father would not spare the sword that would pierce her heart, bringing upon her the distress and misery of that hour. Who among us would not understand and even excuse if Mary dared to mumble under her breath, what kind of God would put a mother through such agony? What kind of God would give you a son and ask you to give him up to crucifixion. But Mary knew she need not ask those questions. The answers she knew so well. What kind of God? A God who knows the deepest love is forged, not in blood or passion, or romance, but in a common mission filled with sacrifice. A God who knows that we are only pilgrims on this earth and that eternity is so close that any earthly goodbye is nothing more than I will soon see you again. At the foot of the cross, Mary received from the Father all she needed in the midst of her passion, hope, the hope of glory, the hope of the resurrection, the hope of all eternity with her Son. She who is the mother of us all. And finally, the great poet Harriet Beecher Stowe in her work, Mary at the Foot of the Cross, once penned these words. All now is darkness. And in that deep stillness, God-man wrestles with that mighty woe. Hark to that cry, the rock of ages rending. It is finished. Mother, all is glory now. For Holy Church, let us pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her and unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God the Father Almighty. Christ, to you, your glory, to all the nations. 
your mercy that your church spread throughout all the world may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our most holy father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord who chose him for the order of bishops may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Almighty and ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favor on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you their Maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith, through Christ our Lord. Amen. For all orders and degrees of the faithful, let us pray for our bishop, Oscar, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Almighty and ever-living God, by whose Spirit the whole body of the Church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy, that having received forgiveness for all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Almighty and ever-living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offspring, increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens, that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children, through Christ our Lord. For the unity of Christians, let us pray also for our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth, to gather them together and keep him in his one church. Almighty and ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, 
that those whom one baptism is consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for the Jewish people to whom the Lord our God spoke first that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Almighty and ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church, that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. For those who do not believe in Christ, let us pray for those who do not yet believe in Christ, that the light of the Holy Spirit might show them the way to salvation. Almighty and eternal God, enable those who do not acknowledge Christ to find the truth as they walk before you in sincerity of heart. Help us to grow in love for one another, to grasp more fully the mystery of the Holy Trinity, and to become more perfect witnesses of your love in the sight of all people, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right in sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Almighty and eternal God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you come to rest, grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you, and so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. Amen. For those in public office, let us pray also for those in public office that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will for the true peace and freedom for all. Almighty and ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of all peoples, look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, 
that throughout the whole world the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace and freedom of religion may through your gift be made secure through Christ our Lord. Let us pray, brothers and sisters, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travelers safety and to pilgrims return, health to the sick and salvation to the dying. Almighty ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength to all who toil, hear the prayers of those who cry out in tribulation, that all may rejoice because in their hour of need your mercy was at hand, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Every Good Friday, a collection is taken in support of the work of the Franciscans in the Holy Land. Christians there rely heavily on the help that comes to them during this special day in the church and our life of faith. Please stand. <clears throat> behold, behold the wood of the cross on which is hung our salvation. Behold, behold, the wood of the cross on which is hung 
our salvation. Behold, behold, the wood of the cross on which is hung our salvation. sides in the middle
the Savior's command, and formed by divine teaching, we dare to pray. Amen. Amen. And deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb.
Almighty, ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy that by partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Bow down for the blessing. May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure through Christ our Lord. Amen.